Well, good morning. Hello, my name is Jackie Anderson, and I'm the Assistant Dean at the University of St. Thomas, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Spring Online Learning Series. Today's session is the Future of Healthcare with Dan McLaughlin. I hope you're joining us today from a place that's healthy and safe, and thank you for joining us today. Um, ironically, this is the third in a series of three planned sessions for our spring series, um, but we've heard such great feedback and actually had several requests that in this time of pandemic to run these sessions a little more frequently. So um, we're, we're answering the feedback and we have now designed an online learning series that will run through the summer. Now we're gonna keep the time at 8 a.m. Um, but we are gonna rotate the days we host these sessions. So each week there'll be a session and it will either be on a Tuesday, a Wednesday or a Thursday. And as is usual, all the topics will be uh, professionally oriented, but many will be addressing um, particular issues that might be impacted during this crazy time of pandemic. Um, as we look ahead, our next three sessions that are upcoming, uh, Tuesday, April 21st, we're gonna welcome Dr. Jean Davidson. She actually is a fellow in the College of Education and the title of her session is Treasures and Trash of Transition, uh, How to Sort Through It All. Then on Wednesday, April 29th, we're going to welcome Leo Hoff. Leo actually led Strategic Decisions Group and his bias is towards strategy and the focus of his session is the value of saying no. And really it's saying no so you can say yes to other key strategic items. And then on Thursday, May 7th, we have a session with Allison Smith. Allison actually teaches in our executive MBA, as well as our St. Thomas executive program that we run through our executive education area. Uh, her focus is on leadership and the title of her session is Leading Virtually Without Virtually Leading. Um, and it has a focus on how the leader can use this time to really transform their leadership practices. So uh, there'll be more sessions announced as uh, we roll forward, but I hope you can join us each week as we host these sessions. It provides some normal to uh, days that aren't so normal anymore. So let me uh, jump into today's session. Our plan for today, the logistics are simple. I'm gonna introduce Dan McLaughlin here in a minute, and he'll spend about 35 to 40 minutes exploring uh, his topic on the future of healthcare. And it's certain to be a doozy. Couldn't have planned this one any better. Um, we are going to try to save all the questions for the end, but you can ask questions anytime during the presentation by using the chat feature. If you're having any issues with sound or logging in, uh, feel free to directly use the chat feature to um, talk to the host. Um, and if you have to step away for any reason, please know that we're recording the session and the link will be sent out as well as put on our website. So with that, then it is my pleasure today to welcome Dan McLaughlin. Dan is actually the director of the Center for Health and Medical Affairs here at the University of St. Thomas. Um, but prior to starting his academic career, he was the CEO of HCMC and served as the chair of the National Association of Public Hospitals and Health Systems. Dan currently teaches in our healthcare MBA, our executive MBA, and actually is launching a new course with executive education on June 1st titled the Manage Managing for the Future of Healthcare. Now, because of uh, the current stay at home restrictions, we are actually offering all of our June courses virtually. So this new program, Managing for the Future of Healthcare will run June 1st through the June 3rd and will be virtually hosted. Um, with that, it is my pleasure to welcome my colleague, and my friend, I'd like to welcome Dan McLaughlin to our online learning series. Uh, thanks, Jackie, and um, welcome to everybody. So um, here's what I'm intending to do today, is let's first talk about the best healthcare system in the world. Do we really have the best healthcare system in the world? Um, you hear that expression from a lot of politicians and a lot of other people, and uh, I think we're gonna work our way through that today. So here's the things I would like to talk about, first of all, what are the big issues in the American healthcare system? And then take a look at the system as a system. So the question about systems thinking is um, everything affects everything. And so uh, let's take a look at all the different pieces. Then we'll talk about the future. And then of course the impact of the virus COVID-19 
And right now we're trying to make sure that we are in fact um, having um, a way to think about that. And then at the end we'll have questions. So let's first talk about some of the heroes in the system. Um, we know right away that we have um, people that in fact are our are, um, are key uh, caregivers. Um, and uh, we've got to really say a lot about them. I mean, right now at the very beginning, I mean, people went into healthcare uh, for lots of reasons, but right now people are putting their lives at risk. And in fact, some of our um, colleagues in the healthcare system have in fact died trying to take care of patients. So a big shout out to all the people that are on the front lines of that. Then I want to also want to talk a little bit about the people that support that. I mean, the people that work in the hospitals, all the housekeepers, all the other kind of people that are important to the hospital itself, including also the public health professionals. Um, there are many, and we're lucky in the state of Minnesota having one of the best public health systems in the country. And then the people that are doing research on that. Also the supply chain. Um, Minnesota's blessed to having quite a bit of a very sophisticated supply chain. Um, and we have some great companies, 3M and Medtronic particularly have been very active in this whole thing. Um, and the whole med device and equipment area. And then of course, the other parts of the system, the health plans that are paying for a lot of this healthcare right now. And the uh, MNsure, our health exchange for people to get insurance right now. And then of course our state and local government. So we got a lot of people in the Minnesota healthcare system that have stood up to this virus and are doing a great job. So let's move on to the next part. So let's talk about the best parts of the system. So we have medical research, I think is some of the very best in the world is in the United States of America. So that is one of the very best parts of the system. Um, the other thing is drug and device development. Um, again, most of the drugs and devices are really developed in the United States of America. And so we are really starting to see some of the, um, the best um, drug and device development now. I mean, it's amazing to think about all the people. I've seen somewhere over 20 to 30 new drugs being developed to deal with the coronavirus. So I think we have, we're pretty excited about having those kind of things um, go underway. Then there is health services research. Again, the, the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota um, um, is in fact one of the leaders of that. And so when you hear about all these models being developed, um, we know that the University of Minnesota is in fact the, um, uh, in fact, the one of the premier research organizations in the country. And so we're, it's lucky that we have that here in Minnesota, but also great in the United States. Then of course, innovation. There is the, the fact that um, we have um, different kinds of um, innovation. Um, I'm just gonna, I wanna check something on my screen. Okay, we have, we have uh, innovation. Actually my center these days is called the Center for Innovation in the Business of Healthcare. And so we are working a lot at St. Thomas to think about how innovation can actually happen. Um, um, and then the uh, next thing, of course, is engage patients. Um, we do have a lot of um, uh, patients that seem to be uh, very active. Um, in some countries, patients are more passive, not in the United States. Uh, patients get very engaged in their health care. And then finally, passionate and skilled caregivers. I mean, one of the things that I've been pleased about spending my, my whole career in healthcare, um, both on the delivery system and now on the educational side, is everybody I work with wants to do the right thing. They love their jobs. It's great to be part of the healthcare system. So some of, that's some of the best parts of our system. But let's talk about some of the things that aren't so great. So um, we have a paradox in the fact that we deliver healthcare in all different ways around the country. So we have geographic variation. You can go from Minnesota, and go with the same condition and go down to Miami, Florida, and it might cost you twice as much. You might not have the same good outcome you have in Minnesota. And so we know that there's variations the way the hospitals and doctors take care of patients. We also know that's even true in, in Minnesota. You can go in different parts of Minnesota and see that. So the question is, why do we have all this variation? And then that brings up the question of quality. Again, we also have quality questions. Um, one, of the, one of the real questions right now is um, the pandemic response. So, uh, even though we have this large, complicated, very expensive system, how come we couldn't have done better in this pandemic response? So we're going to be looking at that, I'm sure, into the future. And then we have the most costly system in the world. So that's the biggest challenge, I think, for the American healthcare system today. So let's take a look at that. So here's the expenditures 
um, for um, for the um, upcoming years. These numbers are a little high. This is a little older graph. So in 2020, we're um, actually a little bit below 18% of our GDP, but you can see the numbers, which are really quite large. And so I think it is a, a challenge as we go forward and you see those numbers keep going up. Um, what does that really cause us? Well, here's an interesting question when you look at comparisons globally. And you can see that top bar, this is the per capita expenditure. This is a few years old, so it's higher than that right now. Uh, but what does that mean really? Well, let's take a look at international competition. So here's a Chevy. And uh, when you look at the Chevy, it's got $1,800 of cost in it of healthcare. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's really all the people that make all the parts for the, for the Chevy and put it together. They all have health insurance and that costs about $1,800. Now, when you look down at Japan down there, now you got a Toyota and it costs $900 in healthcare because Japanese healthcare is so much less expensive than ours. So that causes a real problem with global competition. It's also, as I've been thinking about this also, I think one of the reasons, kind of a subtle reason why some of the supply chain has moved out of the United States. So those parts that are going to the Chevy, they decide maybe if they can get the tires built someplace else in a country that's less healthcare costs, um, then it's better to do that supply chain. So that's something that's a real challenge for our country because of the cost of our healthcare. Here's another problem that most people have been bumping into lately was affordability. And so there's three different little bars in this graph. So the cost of healthcare insurance each month, and you can see that the difficulty in this survey is increasing and in that uh, about 37% just a couple of years ago felt that they had trouble paying for their health insurance premiums. And then copays, same kind of number, and then deductibles, also the same thing. 43% of the people are concerned about the deductibles. And we see more and more uh, deductibles, uh, higher deductibles in the insurance industry. And I'm gonna chat about that a little later too. So here's kind of a complicated diagram, but I wanna point out that this is kind of important because chronic disease is really a key thing. And so if you kind of take a look at the top of this diagram, you see risky actions, and I'm gonna kind of walk through that a little bit. And you see where it says smoking, um, and then you go down and you say, well, that's an action that people have control over because you can smoke or not control. And then it gives you a risk factor is tobacco addiction. And then you go down to some of the diseases, lung cancer, obstructive lung disease, emphysema and bronchitis. You can kind of see that a lot of the chronic diseases have to do with our lifestyle. And, and the little tagline at the bottom is the one that's kind of frightening, which is 80%, 86% of our healthcare expenses are due to chronic and mental health conditions. So we know that there's a whole challenge of chronic disease. Um, when you look at many of the deaths from the COVID-19 virus, um, most of them have got to do with underlying chronic conditions. And so we know that a lot of us are at risk because of our, the chronic disease. So let's take a look at the cost here. Another little kind of complicated diagram, but I'm done with complicated diagrams here in a minute. So this is taking a look at individual healthcare costs. And let's take, let's take you a big graph and you take the most expensive patient and you put that at the top and then you go all the way down to the least expensive patient. And that's what these graphs show. So if you take the little blue bars on the right, you can see that um, you cut that listing of all the 330 million of us in the United States, the lower 50%, so that's you know 100 or whatever 330 divided by two is, um, only cost 3%. So there's a lot of people that are very healthy and have very little healthcare costs. But then the rest of us cost a lot. And if you go and look at the green bars and go to the second bar from the left, you can see that the top 5%, in other words, the most expensive people spend 50% of the money. So we know that healthcare costs are actually really concentrated in a relatively small number of people. So if we know these things, why is it so hard to have our healthcare system deal with these costs. So here's a couple of reasons. One is medicine itself. It is a very complicated business. And there's just a fire hose of information that comes out of medical research. And I've talked to physician friends of mine that said, you know, if they really wanted to read the literature and stay up with the current thing in their field, they might have to read 100 journal articles a day. So it's just amazing the amount of information that comes out of there. So medicine itself is a very complicated business and hard to change. It's a business. So in the United States, we have a mixed system. We have a private healthcare system and we have a government system. And that's one of the challenges we're seeing right now 
because of the, the way that the healthcare system connects to the government and to the private sector. Then compassion, everyone wants to do the right thing. And so that's a very tricky thing to measure what you're gonna do. You've seen some very difficult decisions people are making in some of these hospitals that have been overflowing with COVID-19 patients about <clears throat> how they make the right decisions for the patient in the midst of all the chaos. And so it's a very tricky and complicated business. And then it's personal. Everybody um, is engaged in the healthcare system personally. When you look at other big policy issues, for example, um, climate change and energy production. Um, so we can talk a lot about solar power and wind power, but that is kind of a, you know, informal discussion and you plug your computer in the wall and it works. <clears throat> you don't think about it so much. Personal healthcare. You think about going to the doctor, you're thinking about your kids and your parents going to the doctor. So it's a very personal system. All of those things make it very difficult to change. So let's take a look at this from a systems perspective, because again, the, the idea of systems thinking is that everything affects everything. And so the way I like to think about the system is starting with the core that I'm used to, which is the professional, the patient. So that's in most cases a doctor, but it can be a physician assistant, it can be a pharmacist, it can be the professional. And then patients are kind of all over the place. So let's kind of start pulling this apart. And I'm going to talk about some of the issues and in some cases, some of the, the futures here too. So from the professional side, there are two major things I think influence the professional. One is the tools that they have, the diagnostic and the therapeutic tools, the DX and RX, and then the knowledge they bring to that. And from the patient side, our consumer behavior, and then the illness burden, those are things that we really don't control that well. So let's take these pieces apart a little bit more. So on the tool side, uh, the ones that are big, of course, are medical technology, facilities. Um, it's interesting to see the kind of instant hospitals being built around the country, but facilities are always a big issue. Healthcare workers are incredibly important. They're 60 to 70% of the cost is our workforce. And then information technology, that's pretty exciting. So let's take a look at some of these. So in the healthcare workforce, some issues there are, do we need more primary care providers? So we've always had family physicians and interns and OBGYNs as our primary care and pediatricians as our primary care doctors. But are we starting to see, do we need more of those with more computer technology coming along with more um, physician assistants and nurse practitioners? Um, what's gonna happen there? We do have an aging workforce. And so the, one of the questions is how are we gonna um, deal with some of the people that are kind of moving the baby boomers moving out of um, out of active practice and then scope of practice who gets to do what in these in these systems and so um, we're, we're seeing the boundaries of scope of practice kind of being pushed these days with the COVID-19 as we're seeing people that haven't done some jobs picking them up so that's going to be a new <clears throat> interesting issue in the information technology this is pretty exciting. We have a grant from the GHR Foundation here in the Opus College of Business to take a look at digital uh, impact throughout the, our business school. But um, I'm particularly working on the technology side of digital. So some kind of interesting issues there. One is the maturity of electronic health record. We had funding from the federal government about 10 years ago to help install electronic health records in hospitals and doctors practices. And that frankly was fairly painful for a lot of people in the system but they have kind of gotten through that pain and now we're starting to see um, how we can actually start using some of the data and I'll show you some of the examples a little later here. <clears throat> so we have the big data available to us now and now the power of some of the new analytics and then the internet of things. I are cooking all this stuff together. So we have mobile things going on at Care at Home. Again, I'm gonna talk about that a little more later in the thing, but I think information technology is one of those big parts of the system that's gonna have impacts that we can't really completely understand quite yet. So on the technology front, again, um, we've had continued growth, but cost effectiveness has been a really an interesting issue. It's kind of fascinating to watch the ventilator issue a little bit right now as people are looking at how they can make that medical device maybe in a less costly way. And there was an article in Minneapolis paper today about a really kind of fascinating kind of uh, interim step that some folks at the University of Minnesota have kind of put together that's a very low cost ventilator. Uh, kudos to Medtronic, by the way, for putting one of their ventilators, one of their um, uh, more less sophisticated ventilators, all their diagrams and plans online for people to duplicate. So great for them. Drug costs, pretty hot topic uh, recently. Um, it's been kind of uh, put aside for the moment, but uh, the question about how much costs there really are um, 
is going to be something into the future that's going to be a challenge. And then um, we're pleased to be, for those of us in Minnesota, be the hub for world, the world hub for technology, medical technology. Um, and we're bigger than Silicon Valley. We're bigger than Boston. We're bigger than anything in Europe. And so that's pretty exciting to be part of that industry here in the state of Minnesota. Let's talk about the consumer side. So the consumer here has uh, some information and market and clinical decisions that they kind of bring to the uh, to the to the table when they're making decisions about how they're going to buy their health care. Um, we have more financial and resource goals as a driver because you have a high deductible policy. You might be thinking about where you're going to buy it, but more importantly is when you buy it. So if you're if you've uh, managed to get through your deductible you may find yourself very busy. I predict this fall is gonna be kind of crazy because I think in the, the, the delivery system, my bet is by the fall, uh, we'll have more of the hospitals and the health systems back operating, but then people will be through their deductibles and they'll end up with a lot of people trying to get all their health care before they get to December 31st. So it's gonna be a very interesting time this fall. Um, then the uh, past, experience in personal networks. So we don't shop very well for healthcare, like you would shop for a car or you'd shop for uh, anything else where you actually think about it in advance. Um, I bet if I were to ask you um, that I need a good dentist, what would you say? Well, I've got a good dentist, you know, that I like them. So, or if I said, how about a dermatologist? Do you know a dermatologist? So there are some tools out there for us to pick these things, but we're really not necessarily very good shoppers and particularly we try to think about shopping on price, and I'll talk about that a bit here too. So then we complete my little diagram here with talking about the environment. Um, we know there's a real challenge with the environment, both on just the, the air that we breathe, but also economics and cultural. There's a uh, little thing public health people talk about is one of the best ways to predict uh, your um, health status is your zip code, which is kind of unfortunate and true. And we know that certain communities are really disadvantaged and certain other ones um, aren't. And so that really affects their, their uh, illness. Um, but we also have our genetics we bring to the table. And so depending on our family structure, we may have some illnesses that we're more prone to. One of the nice things right now is there are a lot of new drugs being developed that in fact do have ways to um, deal with those. So some of the consumer behaviors that um, we have to think about there are more incentives right now and health savings account and high deductible policies. So yes, we are in fact all getting more involved in that. Um, and the fact that we are engaged really makes a difference. Um, I think people are more interested in trying to find about prices and so forth. And then um, another kind of phenomenon that's happened in the last 10 years is employer-based wellness programs. I have a picture of Safeway here because they were kind of a poster child during the Affordable Care Act debates. Uh, because they had gone from kind of traditional um, employee wellness programs to more biometric programs where they're measuring people's body mass index and cholesterol levels and blood pressure and, and no smoking. And they said, if you um, manage those effectively, we'll give you some of your premium back. And um, that was one of the first people to do that. And they, in fact, did succeed in that. And so you're starting to see more employers going to those kind of programs. And so <clears throat> it's interesting how the employer is getting more in our life a little bit by doing that. But on the other hand, it is having some good uh, outcomes. So population health has been one of the big challenges, as I mentioned, relative to where you live. And so some of the issues in population health are, of course, exercise and fitness. Some people are very much into exercise and fitness, <clears throat> but a lot of people, particularly in those bars that have the chronic disease I was showing you earlier, are not so much into that. And then if you're living in a disadvantaged community, is there even a place you can go get exercise and get fitness? Um, another one is healthy food availability. Um, there's parts of the, the, the country and parts of our, our city even where it's hard to get fresh vegetables and, and items such as that. I think we're all uh, much more cognizant of our grocery stores these days as, that's, as it's tricky to get food. Or, but nonetheless, healthy food availability is also a big issue in population health. Transportation. So when I was at HCMC, um, we had a problem with people just coming to routine clinic visits because they didn't have cars and the public transportation system didn't work that well for them. And uh, we had at that time about a, a uh, missed appointment rate of about 20%. Recently, uh, the folks that have uh, at HCMC have developed a new system called Hitch Health 
that um, uses Lyft and some kind of sophisticated computer computer algorithms to provide rides for people, and they've cut that in half. And so it's still too bad that there's 10%, but that's a lot better than it was when I was there. So transportation is kind of one of those subtle things you don't think about as healthcare, but it's a big part of it. Healthcare literacy. Um, we use an awful lot of words in healthcare that people don't understand. And so there's a question about the words themselves and how do you communicate to a patient that they have hypertension? What does that mean? You know, that means you have high blood pressure. And so, and there's just a language barrier. We have still quite a few uh, folks that are new to the United States. Um, and um, so that's a challenge for just translation and literacy. And then racial disparities. And sadly, we're seeing today that there's a disproportionate number of people dying of the COVID-19 virus in the African-American community, um, much more than their representation in those cities where they live. So we know that there's racial disparities in the system and that is a big challenge. Um, one of the things I'm pretty excited about at St. Thomas is we have a new co college of health here. And I just talked recently to our new Dean and she's very interested in community engagement, cultural and racial disparities. And I think you'll see in our new college of health um, that we'll see, we'll be working on this year pretty strongly. So um, in the education quadrant down here in the lower left, some issues in that area. Um, so um, for example, again, primary care, how are we going to take a look at how we train new professionals for the primary care of the future? Uh, again, new practice issues. And then um, the question about, are we gonna keep subspecializing? We keep having in all the different specialties, subspecialties and sub subspecialties. Is that the way we want to train people from the future? Or can we use some of these new uh, complicated but very sophisticated computer systems to help there? On clinical research, <clears throat> one of the things that has not gotten a lot of publicity over the years is to go back and look at some of the standard practices and do comparative effective research. Like which really works better? Does this drug work better than that drug, even though we've been using both of them for 10, 15 years? And so there's a lot of work going on in that. Um, you know, the question of have we done the right health research to, to have us do well in our public health and pandemic response? And the answer is, is I think today is eh, maybe not so great. So I think um, after this is kind of over and stabilized, I think you're gonna see a lot more work in the research on both the public health surveillance and how we take a look at early signs for pandemics and then um, how we actually deal with them. So I think there's gonna be a lot more research um, there's been funding challenges always. Um, NIH is always underfunded and um, some of the other research going on doesn't get enough funding, but there's kind of an exciting thing, which is that because of all these electronic health records, there's a lot of big data out there that we can start going back and looking at what we've been done, particularly for comparative effectiveness research. Take a look at what has been done in the past and then say, man, this drug actually does work better than that when I look at all the patients that are in my healthcare system. So I'm pretty optimistic on having that big database into the future. So then uh, the financing side. So let's talk about the money part a little bit. So the money really comes from different, three different places. The government programs, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, the employers are 130 million of us get our health insurance through our employers. And then individuals who are paying a lot more these days. So um, one of the things that the healthcare system's been trying to do is been trying to um, minimize the amount of money that we're spending on this top of this diagram up there. So the most expensive thing we could do is the hospital ICU, and we've been seeing a lot of that recently. But then you can kind of walk down this little arrow there down to prevention and wellness and supportive communities. That goes back to that diagram I showed about chronic disease. So the more we can do there, the better we can do it. The term that people are using for this kind of part of the payment system is social determinants of health. So if you look at housing and transportation and some of those issues, um, you say, well, are those really healthcare issues or aren't they? And so one of the challenges into the future is how do you start paying for things um, that are part of the social determinants of health that have not been historically thought of as a healthcare cost, like a immunization or a, a clinic visit. So do you buy an air conditioner for somebody with asthma? So that's a real kind of a question into the future. So some of the health insurance issues these days is um, we do, we have a fee for service system right now, which means that you, um, if you're a physician and you render a service to somebody, you send a fee and um, the number of different fees you can send is kind of amazing. Um, when I was at HCMC, um, every year the 
chief financial officer would come in and say, well, here's our charges for you, our charge master. And he had this big printout. Those were the days of printouts that had 13,000 prices on it. That was for our hospital. And I've heard recently that that number is up to 20,000 right now. So we have this incredibly complicated billing system with all these different um, prices in it. So, and the other thing is, it in fact, does reward um, financial rewards. The more you do, the more you get paid. So that's a, a challenge. We are starting to deal with that by using bundling and value purchasing systems, which bundling is kind of interesting ideas where you take a whole set of services and put them into one bucket of costs and then just pay for that. So for example, a hip replacement might have pre-op uh, training and, and care, the surgery itself, the device itself, the surgeon's fee, and then afterwards the physical therapy and all the care afterwards, put that all into one bundle and pay for that. Um, so that's one way that we're starting to get into this problem about rewarding inefficiency of the fee-for-service system. Another thing we've got in the health insurance is the markets are getting more concentrated. We have some very big players. We're also pleased in Minnesota to be the home of United Healthcare, which is the largest private insurance company in the world. And, um, but the question is, is there real competition when you, get, when you have all those uh, very large players in the market? Um, high deductibles, as I said, that's going to be more of an issue for all of us as individuals. And then this lack of useful price information. So how do you actually go shop for that if there's 20,000 prices at Hennepin County Medical Center? Um, so that's, that's a real challenge. Another thing that's recently kind of come up on the radar is um, a thing called surprise billing, which is when people go to some uh, healthcare systems and they think that they're being, all the the doctors and the services in the system are being covered by their um, health plan. In fact, they may not be. And so all of a sudden they get a surprise bill from somebody that didn't take care of them, but was not in their health plan network, a surprise bill that can be a lot of money. So that's a, that's a challenge for the future. And then again, this is a pretty complicated system. So let's talk about some of the things that I think are going to happen in the future. Uh, I've talked about a bunch of them as I've gone through the systems analysis, but here's a few more specifics. So um, first of all, a lot of people are getting older, so we see more and more people going on to Medicare. Um, and uh, there's some policy issues kicking around there that might even expand Medicare downward, so there'd be even more Medicare patients. So how do you think about that from a government spending? But the other thing, of course, is a lot of people that are older continue to work um, beyond the Medicare rate, so they're contributing back to communities. So it's going to be a complicated issue, but there's going to be more older people around, that's for sure. Um, Chronic disease management. So there's kind of all these different pieces here that we're that we're working on to get to deal with that set of people who have chronic disease. So analytics, better outreach, better system design, a thing called medical home, which is a better way to do primary care in a more comprehensive way. Um, improved mental health and SUD is substance use disorder. So one of the challenges in mental health of people that have both these physiological problems and mental health or substance disorder. Um, how do you deal with that? But I think people are working on that hard. Community and organizational leadership, so people are more engaged. That's like, as I said, I think our new St. Thomas College of Health is going to be involved in that. And then home care, care coordination. So, yes, we've been learning a lot about how to do more at home uh, since the pandemic. So the other thing on the uh, future here is what's going on with providers? Well, providers have been kind of off by themselves, kind of. There's the hospital systems, the doctor systems, and then the insurance companies. And then the rest of the private sector has just been providing benefits to employers, but that's starting to break down. And one of the interesting new setups is Amazon with Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan. These three giant companies have formed a system called Haven, and they're trying to reinvent healthcare from both the delivery side and also from their employee side. And um, Amazon right now has bought a company called PillPack. You've probably seen ads for that. So they're kind of got their toe in the pharmacy business. We'll see where that goes. But Amazon sure knows how to do online stuff, so we'll see what happens there. Cigna, big insurance company, acquired Express Scripts, which is a pharmacy benefit management company. And then CVS, a big pharmacy train, acquired Aetna. So we're going to see a lot of interesting mergers and acquisitions. Uh, primary care is going to, because we do know that primary care is um, probably underfunded, but you also know good primary care is one of those things that does reduce chronic disease. So I think there's going to be more money into that. I think the individual market's pretty interesting. Uh, for those of us who have had employer-sponsored insurance for most of our life, we're not used to picking individual medical, but Medicare Advantage, so Medicare enrollees right now have the option of using traditional Medicare 
or selecting a health plan. And uh, as of now, about a third of the um, people in Medicare have selected an individual health plan. You see all that advertising in the fall about that usually. And that number keeps going up. So that is a, taking Medicare, which is a government program, and making it into individual market. Another little sleeper here is a thing called ICRAS, which is Individual Contribution Health Reimbursement Arrangement. How's that for an acronym? Um, what that really means is companies now, smaller companies, I think is under 250 employees, can take a certain amount of money, like say $5,000, and just give it to their employees to go buy in the individual market. And so that counts as an allowable expense to the company. All of a sudden, the employees in individual market, so they could go to Minture or to a broker and buy their own health insurance. If that's expanded, you could see more and more companies would start saying, well, I don't want to be in the benefits business anymore in healthcare. I'm going to give my employees money. I don't know if that's a speculation on my part, but I think that might be pretty exciting. We're going to see um, a thing called accountable care organizations and provider-sponsored plans, all kinds of the health plan delivery system getting hooked up with, with a, um, uh, a health plan. I think of the more recent one, as you've seen, Alina, Alina and Aetna got together. I think they're mostly targeted at the Medicare Advantage market. We see more of that. More of this value purchasing. Some of this uh, payments for the social determinants of health. There's a Medicare rule recently that said that they could, in fact, start paying for that. So some of the health plans are doing that. And then, as I said, all the debate we've had this year about Medicare for all. Um, and I think that's not going to happen. But there might be, I think... Uh, uh, Vice President Biden has talked about having a Medicare ages expansion, in other words, downward, maybe to 60, for his um, policy positions. And then the public auction in the, in the um, health exchanges is also on the table. So how are we trying to bend this cost curve? So here's some of the ways we've been doing it. Um, so we take all these pieces together. This is kind of in one little slide here, the answer to this cost problem. The first one is competition between health plans. If, in fact, we get more competition. And the, if you have more people in the individual market, I think you might get more competition. Um, where people will be saying, I wanna go to this health plan, this maybe integrated system, and maybe for a lower price. We'll see if that works or not, but that's one of the things that I think people believe is a possibility. Um, the substitution of lower price care, that kind of diagram they showed, they kind of move more to the community outpatient care and into the home. Uh, more primary care, better chronic care management, and then the system costs. A big chunk of the American healthcare system is all this crazy billing systems we've got and the connections of all these. Um, now that the computer systems are getting better, the, uh, the analytics and everything, I think that's gonna potentially uh, reduce. And then comparative infection research, uh, reducing variations, just having most of the clinicians and everybody in the healthcare system use the best practices. From our side, I think there's more interest in prevention and wellness, particularly these days. I think the other thing is, one of the things about social distancing is kind of that I think is interesting is that that really makes us think about a lot more about how our own personal behavior affects everybody else. So I think the whole thing about behavior affecting your wellness is really coming home to us all right now as we do our social distancing and thinking about that. Population health, as I said, is a big one. Um, I don't think the high deductible plans are gonna go away, but I do think we're gonna have better ways to do pricing transparency. And I do think there's gonna be more pressure on the drug companies to reduce their costs. So some other things I think are more disruptive in the system. So um, care at home, wow. Aren't we thinking about all the different ways of doing care at home because we don't want to do, we don't want to go to the doctor's office. Um, advanced telemedicine, I'm amazed talking to friends of mine and my family members about the things they've been able to do online. Um, even saw some stuff recently on online dentistry, which I find kind of amazing. Um, so I think we're gonna see more advances in telemedicine. Uh, more opportunities for clinicians and patients both to take a look at um, the best research. I think all of us have probably become kind of uh, minor epidemiologists these days looking at their research. Uh, digital therapeutics, we have a future of healthcare conference once a year in the fall and last year we had one of the presenters from a big system in Milwaukee talking about how the fact that they are starting to prescribe apps and home monitoring devices just as though they prescribe a medicine or physical therapy hence digital therapeutics. So we're gonna see more doctors actually telling you, here, use this app on your phone to monitor something. And then the clinical advances in drugs, um, we really are pretty excited about, I think, the, the opportunities right now to deal with the virus from the, from the drug side. Again, a lot of energy in that thing. And then of course, robots. I have to leave my little robot picture here. 
Um, um, one of the big issues in inpatient nursing care for nurses is lifting patients out of beds. And so here's, you got a robot lifting your patients. So we're gonna see robotics in kind of fascinating ways in healthcare in the future. Um, from the operation sides, uh, interoperability and connected providers. Um, we've got all those big systems. Can we hook them together? That's been a, a big kind of a big policy debate in Washington, but that's getting being more. And in fact, just some recent regulations are gonna make that even better. Telemedicine, as I mentioned, uh, image recognition. So now we're seeing computers that can read x-ray images pretty well and uh, also cardiograms, lots of things. So we're seeing some very fancy things going interrupt inter image recognition front. Um, Chatbots, um, one of my students who is a long-term care administrator is saying they're starting to use Alexa for long-term care. That's why I got this little picture here. So if you have a memory unit, a patient that has uh, memory issues or Alzheimer's and the patient keep saying, what time is it? You can say that to Alexa and Alexa will be happy to tell that time. And you can say it again five minutes later, no problem. You can also hook it into a, a thermostat and you can say, please turn, it's too hot in here, please turn down the heat and Alexa can do that. And you had a better system and you actually have saved some staff costs. Turns out that patients like these systems too. So that's kind of interesting. So we're gonna see a lot of different kind of fascinating things in the chatbot robot world. One of the things I find interesting for the business side is Best Buy has acquired a company called Great Call, which does a lot of this kind of work. And so if they're getting into the home healthcare market, particularly you think with their geek squad going out and be able to install a lot of stuff. So that's pretty exciting. On the big data side, um, we're being able to take a lot of looks at the way we can uh, do analysis of all the, the data out there. Um, we're also, as I said, doing clinical trials for electronic records. Now you've got the big databases out there. You can say, well, what about this drug? What about that drug? You can go, actually go back, pull it out of your database and say, oh, we did actually do this and that worked and that didn't work. So that's pretty exciting. I think one of the things you're seeing now is everybody desperately trying to find good um, therapies for the COVID-19 virus is they're gonna have all this electronic data that they can share quickly. So that's gonna make things move a lot faster. Um, we can do a lot of predictive analytics. We can predict what's gonna happen in our hospitals, image and text mining, genetic modeling. We're starting to be able to take a look at people's genes and do that. And I just wanna talk about my little dog picture here um, because I think this is kind of fun. So uh, one of the things going back to social determinants of health and our lifestyle is that we do know that um, all of these practices that are not really healthcare affect our healthcare costs. And one of the companies that we're, we like, it's a Minnesota company, it's called Carrot Health. And they have, um, they take consumer databases and they take a look at how they affect people's healthcare costs and they help, help, they help health plans work on those kind of issues. And um, the, the, one of the fascinating findings is they, uh, they took a look at uh, males, um, 45 years old, um, that were married or not married, traveled or didn't map, traveled or had a dog. And those people that were married and traveled a lot and had a dog spent $15,000 a year on their care if they were diabetic. If you took a diabetic guy, that was the same thing, diabetic, 45 years, not married, no travel, no pet, they cost $15,000 more. So why would a dog make a difference? Well, you think about the lifestyle of maintaining a dog, you've got to go out and you know, uh, take them out for a walk. You've got to be organized in your life to make sure you feed them. And so you can kind of see it. All these kind of things can predict different things in healthcare. The $5,000 number there, 5,000 number is, that's the number of data points uh, Care Health Now has on everybody in the country. Because of using all these data points, they can tell whether you and I have got a dog or not. And they can tell a lot of these things. That's a little scary, but from a community health perspective, it's also kind of exciting because we can make some interventions then. So um, here are things I just think about uh, the impact directly of the, uh, the virus. Um, I think when this is all said, there's gonna be some sort of national commission kind of like after 9-11. I think we'll see a lot of different uh, things that are gonna get fixed into the future. I think the lab thing is kind of crazy why we can't get that done. Um, it is really exciting to see Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota stepping up. I, I just saw today that Mayo said that they could be doing all the tests that needed in Minnesota fairly soon here. So that's pretty exciting, but why did it take us so long to do that? So that's gonna be a big question in the future. The supply chain, we've seen all kinds of problems there. Um, and that's another question is why is that a problem? The biggest problem has been that I think is that we try to have the system so we could in fact um, um, not have too much supplies on hand. And so the result of that got us into some, some trouble. Um, these national reserves are gonna have to be taken a look at. The uh, public health system, yes, we're gonna have to 
think about that. Our contact tracing is going to be a real challenge over the next six months. Uh, the workforce flexibility, how are we going to use our workforce? I think there's been some really interesting experiments that people have run. And people are, I've already seen some physician assistants saying, hey, we did all this stuff in the pandemic. I think that I still be able to do that. The other one is, I think some of the financial systems that have suffered in this are going to get acquired. And I heard Optum talking about um, uh, actually acquiring some practices around the country that are not um, – strong financially that might become part of Optum. So I think we'll see a lot of that too. We had a meeting recently about higher education here and our Dean said, I thought it was pretty interesting uh, about higher education that what we're doing now, which is teaching all online won't last, but we're not gonna go back to the way it was. It's not gonna be just completely back in the classroom. It's gonna be something different. And I think that's also the same thing about healthcare. Uh, once we get the vaccine and we go back, I think we've learned a lot that will be a little bit different. So, um, this is what uh, Winston Churchill said about us. This is Winston Churchill was the prime minister during World War II. And uh, I think it's pretty true is that, yeah, we're trying a lot of stuff, but we usually always find the right answer. And so when I think about things, I am really optimistic that uh, not only do we have the best healthcare system in the world today, it's expensive, but it's still the best healthcare system. And it's gonna be the best scale healthcare system into the future. So with that, um, I'm done. And I'd be happy to answer some questions. I think Jackie's gonna be the moderator here. Yep. Hello, Dan. Thank you for a great presentation. I have to admit, I'm starting to think about getting a dog. Um, with that, I have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, okay. And actually, it's relevant to some of your uh, last few slides. You had mentioned um, some of the trends in healthcare. So here's the question. What trends with healthcare, like the push to telemedicine, do you think will continue post-COVID-19 crisis or what should continue or change? Um, I do think the telemedicine thing will definitely continue. It was kind of slow to start, but I think that um, providers have decided that they like it. And I think that um, the patients for sure will like it. Um, and so I think telemedicine is gonna continue. Um, and I think that the whole question about how we <clears throat> monitor our health status at home is gonna get more sophisticated. So I think, there are going to be um, more in-home devices, maybe even some devices where you can take blood samples um, and be able to do that. Once you think about taking a blood sample and being able to do like listen to heart rhythms and a bunch of those other kind of things, you're getting pretty sophisticated about what you can do in your own house. So I think the whole move of technology into the home is going to continue and expand. Um, I'm waiting for the robots to do my laundry, but they're not quite there yet. But. <laughs> All right, thank you. You had talked about big data in your presentation, and there's a specific question that says, with all the big data, do you have a concern about privacy? Yes, that is a big challenge. <clears throat> I mean, most of the data analytics that are being done on the macro scale have de-identified data. But on the other hand, we look at Care Health being able to find all that information about it. There's a real question about um, how, how much people know about us already. And, and there is this kind of general question about do we really care about privacy? One of the interesting things that's going to happen in contact tracing. So as we start getting the testing up to speed and we start coming back to work more, one of the big public health interventions is if you test somebody positive, then you got to go back and figure out who all their contacts were. And so then how do you find those people? And do you give up some privacy when you do that? So we're going to be debating that privacy issue right now into the next few months. Um, and that's going to be fascinating. Um, I think, some of our younger students, when I'm teaching undergraduates here at St. Thomas, um, they don't seem to care about privacy that much, but are already giving up their privacy and all different social things. So, so that's kind of a, maybe an old person's kind of question, but it's going to be one into the future. Thank you for that. Um, here's a question about social determinants of health. What social determinants of health are you seeing health plans starting to cover? Um, a couple of them. One is housing, interestingly enough. Um, <laughs> I was talking to a class of our United Healthcare students and I said, well, you know, I don't think anybody ever do anything in housing. And uh, one of my students raised his hand, yeah, no, we're doing it in Phoenix. And so, um, yeah, so there's a question about um, making those decisions about housing, transportation for sure. Um, food is kind of a more challenging one, but um, yeah, I think, I think you're starting to see it. And again, Medicare, uh, to get to kind of technical, the Chronic Care Act of uh, 2018 provided the ability for the health plans, the, particularly the Medicare Advantage plans, to take some of their dollars and spend it for those uh, social determinants. I think it's fascinating from a kind of a technical perspective is 
the health plans particularly are really saying, can I put money into housing? And will that in fact actually save me money as a health plan? And the answer is yes in some situations. So I think they're gonna be doing that and we'll see more expansion there. The next question is about unique trends. What unique trends have you seen in ambulatory care versus hospital care for treatment slash surgery? Um, well, one of the things that has a big change over the last, since I was a hospital administrator, is more and more of the ambulatory care has moved out of the hospital. So you see a lot of standalone surgical centers, a lot of other things that have moved out of the hospitals. Um, from a hospital financing perspective, that's a challenge because many of the things you did that were like ambulatory surgery were relatively profitable. And so if you, if you leave yourself with just the ICU care, um, it's going to be tricky to be financially solvent, but that's more of a financing question. But I think you're going to see more and more of the movement from out of the hospital into the outpatient clinics and out of the outpatient clinics into the home. And so that's the kind of trend we're seeing. All right, next question. Um, will there be a place for human interaction in the new healthcare models? Yeah, so are the robots gonna be taking care of us all? Um, uh, well, I hope I have to find a friendly robot, but um, the, um, I think that um, one of the things that is unique about humans is empathy. That's a word that I think is important. And if you, this is kind of a little kind of arcane argument, but if you go back to when we kind of ended up going from apes to humans, uh, one of the things that we, we were able to do was to form tribes. And so that was our way that we survived. And how do we form tribes? It was empathy. We had this way we connected with each other. And I still think that that's a key part of the healthcare system. And even though I like technology and I like all the computer stuff, I would rather go talk to my doctor or my nurse and uh, see them and have, look them in the eye and have them talk to me and if they got some bad news to put a hand on my shoulder and say, hey, Dan, I hate to tell you about this, but this is the problem. And so I think there's always going to be that part of it, the human connection, the empathy part. Um, but there's some stuff that's pretty routine that the, the computers can do. So we're going to, the challenge is to match those things. But I think there's always going to be a place for people in the system. All right. I'm going to get through a few more here. Uh, when you talk about the benefits of diet, exercise, transportation, et cetera, and the benefits to health, is there consideration to combining, coordinating health programs and welfare programs to avoid duplication of effort and duplication of resources? Ah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, um, so if you're talking about Medicaid, I think, um, yes, there are um, some work going on. Now, most of the Medicaid in Minnesota is actually delivered through our health plans. So the state of Minnesota contracts with health partners and uh, all the other kind of big health plans, Medica, to deliver the services. Um, and so they are thinking all the time about are they coordinating well with the other systems. But yeah, there's a problem that you might have some duplication. If you think about housing, so housing is a lot of pretty subsidized housing is paid for by the government. You want to then pay for it through a different way. So yeah, that's going to be a challenge as you move out of the classic healthcare boundaries that we think about of doctors and hospitals into this social determinant space. All right. Uh, I have a question about billing. Um, you talk about the billing burden on the health system as a major cost. You mentioned EHR alleviating that to some extent. Do you not see a multi-payer system as a root cause of this, of providers needing to cater to a diverse payer mix? Ah, a Medicare for all question. That's a good one. <laughs> um, sure. Um, that's always been a real question. That's a challenge. Um, for people who have been supportive of a single payer Medicare for all system, because that's clearly more efficient if you have one system. Um, but there is not as much innovation, you could argue, if you look at the national health systems around the globe. Um, but I think one of the things that I find kind of a little fascinating and optimistic about is the advent of AI, artificial intelligence. Um, and I think that some of the complications that we see as consumers are slowly gonna start going away. We all get these crazy things called EOBs, explanation of benefits. It says, this is not a bill. And then you could look at that and say, what does this mean? And I, even me who've been in this business a long time, I look at my EOBs and I'm going, what? I don't understand that. So why can't we at least simplify that project process? So I think we're gonna, but I think everybody understands that's a problem that's in the system and people are working on it. So I think even though underlying it is very complicated, it may look more um, easy to ask. I look at the banking system 
inside the bank system, I'm sure it's very complicated. But when I go to my ATM, I put the my card in, I get the money out, it works. So I think we need something like that for healthcare. All right, I'm going to try to get through one or two more questions. Um, do you know any companies now doing the home monitoring for an average consumer? Uh, wow, I don't um, know that. Um, but I would, um, I would go back through your, your healthcare system, your primary care doctor and say, you know, is there some way I could monitor this, whatever your condition is at home? And I bet you right now, your physician, your nurse practitioner, your physician assistant are going to be available that I had one of the students, one of my classes who was a diabetic educator for one of the systems. And she said she was always having all these questions with her physicians about which of these various devices they wanted to use. So there's a lot of stuff out there, but I'd go through your healthcare professionals to find it. Thank you. And I got one last question and we'll wrap it up here, Dan. And you, you alluded to this. How can I get cost and quality information on my healthcare provider that is easy to understand? Ah, thank you for that one. Um, so there's a, one of my favorite organizations that's not as well known as it should be. It's called Minnesota Community Measurement. Okay, everybody write that down and, and then Google that. And you'll find um, this, comp- this organization, nonprofit's been here for 10, 15 years. They collect data from all the health plans, from the provider systems. Very easy to understand. I think it's a thing called Minnesota Health Scores that they do. It shows you all the different providers, their quality. Um, I actually had to change providers because I'm kind of geeky. I went to them and looked exactly where I thought I was going to go. Looked at the plan. Good quality, good costs. Um, you can even look at prices, too. You want to find out what price for colonoscopy? They've got all the prices. So anyway, Minnesota Community Measurement, please use that resource. It's great. Great. Well, Dan, I can't thank you enough for a great session. Very informative. Um, As I mentioned, uh, Dan is the quarterback of our new program that we're launching virtually on June 1st. It runs June 1st through the 3rd, and it's titled Managing for the Future of Healthcare. All executive education courses are going to continue to be virtual through the end of June. Classes are still filling up. I hope you consider that and uh, visit our website. So our next online learning session is next week, Tuesday, April 21st, with Dr. Jean Davidson. It's titled Treasures and Trash of Transition. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's session. Be well and uh, hope to see you next week. Thank you for joining us at the University of St. Thomas.